So we're going to start with Jasper, Jasper, Jasper Ruby, who won the 2014 President's Dissertation Medal with his work, Made Ground, A Spatial History of City Park, nominated for the awards by the University of Sydney. Hello everyone, and uh, thank you for coming. Thanks also to the panel for giving me this opportunity to present to you. And of course, congratulations to Sheila and John for the medal and the last night's terrific presentation. So, without further ado, uh, the dissertation that I'm presenting to you today is in the broadest sense an investigation of the cultural and historical landscape of Australia. As its name suggests, it focuses on Sydney Park, one of Sydney's largest parks located in the inner city suburb of St Peter's and one that in its current state forms a unique urban threshold occupying a zone of increasing gentrification as well as continuing industrialisation. Because it is separated from surrounding residential zones by major arterial roads, it has often been appropriated as a place of uh, many different and uninhibited uses. Uh, unofficial street parties, uh, bicycle races, exhibitions, as a, as a beat, as a rumoured elephant burial ground, and as a homeless shelter, among others. Its rolling hills, pockets of native plantations, curved paths, and its ever-present chimney stacks combine to produce a unique spatial character that triggered my interest in the park initially, but also continued to draw me further into the history of its many and, and varied uses. In Made Ground, uh, Sydney Park is used as a case study with which to introduce the concept of a spatial history. Uh, essentially, and, and somewhat simplistically, this is a theory of interpretation, of interpreting the many scales at which the events of the past occur and situating them within historical and, and spatial narratives. Made Ground is composed of six essays that collectively discuss a series of practices, tools and beliefs in the historical production of Australia's physical and social space. The landscape painting, the map, the subjugating construct of the Australian native or Aboriginal and the narrativization of the natural environment are presented as some of the influential features in Sydney Park's past. The dissertation demonstrates that the park's uh, past is replete with narratives of individual intentionalities, expropriations, tacit patterns of renewal and decay, and manifestations of power in a specific place. These, these, these are a spatial history. Mayground also simultaneously pursues a close reading of the literary work produced by the Australian architect and academic Paul Carter, who is credited with first coining the term spatial history in his 1987 work, The Road to Botany Bay, an essay in spatial history. The spatial histories Carter's writings present and the discourses they, they canvas are taken up as a further point of inquiry in, in the dissertation. Ultimately, alongside presenting the events of Sydney Park's past, I was motivated by knowing what it would be like to do historical research and write in close accord with Carter's principles, as well as better understanding the discourses his spatial histories originated from. This is what the dissertation sets out to do across something close to 60,000 words, so obviously I can't cover all of this in today's presentation. Instead of trying to present the historical content of Sydney Park in its entirety, I will instead use this same history of Sydney Park to focus primarily on the ideas or the conceptual framework that drove the research and inform the ways in which the dissertation presented its findings. In doing this, I'll be drawing on ideas that are very much situated outside the conventional in regards to architectural theory, However, I've decided to do this because I'm, I'm guessing it is these ideas and the bearing they have on thinking about architecture, landscape and, and place that attracted the attention of the judges to begin with. Obviously, I'm more than happy to take um, questions regarding the specific history of Sydney Park once I've finished. First, however, I think it would be most helpful to introduce some of the findings from my research and to properly introduce Sydney Park itself. The park's history is, in, in many ways, typical of Sydney's broader history. This begins with a reading of its geology, uh, which is stratifications of sandstone and shale characteristic of the Greater Sydney region that influenced how the site was valued and used by different people at different times, seeking different ends. Initially, however, the infertile ash-like layer of topsoil found at the park 
um, concealed the fertile clays and loams below that were ultimately what pioneering settlers sought um, to develop their agriculture. This is documented in the many journals kept by colonists that chronicled the arrival of the first fleet uh, in Sydney and the many mentions they make in these journals to the poor soil quality of the Botany Bay area to which Sydney Park directly belongs. Instead of inviting agriculture, the area was left as a frontier from 1788 of the arrival of the first fleet until the early, early 1820s. This was a frontier into which Aboriginal communities and individuals were expelled or fled to in order to avoid all manner of different types of persecution as well as the smallpox epidemic of 1789. As time wore on and Australia's once abstruse and arcane landscape was increasingly absorbed into the settler's sense of belonging or home, <coughs> Sydney Park's as yet physically unscathed landscape was transferred, transformed from this same Aboriginal frontier into picturesque pleasure grounds. This was uh, used by entertainment for Sydney's emerging gentry uh, who were drawn to the scattered heath and scrubland of the coastal landscape of Sydney, as well as the sclerophyll forests of, that flank the nearby Cooks River. This was short-lived, however, and by the 1850s, the housing boom uh, in Sydney put an end to this period in which the land at present-day Sydney Park was left more or less untouched. <coughs> by this time, it was well understood where the clays and shales required for brick-making would be found, such that the park-like grounds of the area were enthusiastically cleared by a new and, at this point, burgeoning industry. So much so that at one point over 120 individual brickworks were active on the site of, of today's park. As earth was excavated, moulded into bricks, uh, moulded into shape and baked into bricks, the pits continued to grow up to as deep as 60 metres in some areas. Um, after the brickworks eventually closed, a rubbish dump was opened in their place, and the once sublime landscape of staggering cliffs and, and small canyons was covered up by the detritus of a now urbanised Sydney. As houses were demolished in Sydney and replaced, the very same bricks that had once been extracted from the ground of Sydney Park returned to their place of origin in the form of builder's rubble. This landscape of waste and, and um, destruction underlies today's park. The landfill has created large hills that emulate the site's original character, while pockets of vegetation weave between car parks and cricket pitches. Bits and pieces of the park's industrial history remain, but they or most notably the Chimney Stacks, but they do so as sort of disjointed, ad hoc, and ahistorical architectural features um, in a landscape of, of urbanisation. Although these narratives, as I've just presented them, fashion a continuity between an origin, in this case pre-settlement, and an endpoint, or the present day, this is in fact not how they're presented in the dissertation. Rather than chronologically, the dissertation's essays are ordered thematically as a way of disrupting the conventional historiographical paradigm of chronology as, as causality. Instead, they seek out, as an example, how the physical ground has been treated over time and what impact it can be seen to have had at different uh, temporal and physical scales. The aim in doing this is to arrive at questions. Questions that problematise what, in this example, the ground might be able to say about the ongoing process of colonisation, about architecture, construction, about what Australia means as a, as a concept or an episteme, uh, and how we as Australians might better understand our history, ourselves, and ultimately the future. Proceeding as it does in this sort of peripatetic way, May Ground seeks to repeatedly underline the creative and post-colonial capacity of interpreting the texts and records of the past as a way of destabilizing our assumptions about the places of the present. In effect, it aims to demonstrate that spatial histories can lead us to alternative relationships with place, bringing out the social agendas that have formed the land and bringing out multiple readings of places and landscapes that mean different things to different people at different times. A further example of this intention that's carried out <coughs> throughout the dissertation is found in an essay that, um, that is included in the dissertation that approaches a specific period in Sydney Park's history through the many paintings completed of its landscape. The European aesthetic model of the picturesque was adopted by wealthy um, land-holding settlers who saw sublimity and romance in the area's diverse landscape. These same landowners uh, continually commissioned settler artists to produce a kind of propaganda 
that stylized Sydney's scattered, scattered heath and scrubland in the aesthetic of the picturesque. This was, I argue in the dissertation, a way of imagining or, or imaging Australia's natural environment in an aesthetic vision that furnished um, the colony's historical space as a direct extension of the British Empire, and, and therein provided a sort of spectatorial scheme within which the landscapes of settlement Australia could be translated into a familiar aesthetic language and therefore be, be qualified. The spatial hierarchy the picturesque vision constructed, and because this vision influenced the way um, landscapes were utilised or preserved by powerful colonists, um, is proposed as one of settlements first, in this case, landscape architectures in the dissertation. In the project of a spatial history, there is no regard for objectivity independent of intention, such that each essay in the dissertation seeks to efface the authority I myself had as their writer or as the curator of historical texts and, and media. In this sense, spatial histories can be said to assume that the way we understand the past is a construction of the present and a product of contextualised interpretations tied to the individual predispositions and fore understandings of its inquiries. Although made grounds atemporal and um, or atemporal approach to telling or retelling stories about the past may seem obtuse or somehow problematic to some. The dissertation is structured so that each essay feeds into the next, as I've mentioned, thematically, unfolding and unfurling across different scales of time and across the many competing psychogeographies of Australian spatiality. Historical narratives such as those I have introduced can be extracted from the dissertation's spatial narratives, or spatial histories. However, these narratives are ultimately secondary. What is primary is using spatiality as a way of deriving meaning and using history as a tool for inquiry as a generator of further open-ended and future-oriented questions. This is what I propose as the means by which spatial histories can contribute to historical, sociological, and architectural discourses. My account of spatial history's conceptual framework has, has so far, focused predominantly on how it rethinks the capacity of historiography, of researching and making inquiries into the past as a way of constructing and knowing a historicized reality. However, this account has not or does not adequately convey how historiography relates to spatiality in the project of a spatial history. This link is mo made most clearly by, by Paul Carter. In his texts, and therefore by inference also in, in my dissertation made ground, the study of spatiality advances <coughs> with the belief that the absolute space of the ruler, the map, or the 3D model can only ever be an abstraction. So even if it is a theoretical possibility, upon the moment it is met with experience, it becomes relativized social and historical space. In The Road to Botany Bay, Carter writes, the discoverers, the explorers, and settlers were making spatial history. They were choosing directions, applying names, imagining goals, inhabiting the country. What is evoked here are the spatial forms and fantasies through which a culture declares its presence. It is spatiality as a form of writing, as a form of history. In contrast to spatial historical inquiry, architectural site, site analysis operates, as it has been described to me during my design education, like a biopsy. That is primarily concerned with material evidence and more importantly with the belief that the truth, the facts and their meaning exist independently of the processes that seek to reveal them. In this sense, the architectural site, and further still, space itself, is treated as an operative plane. The various types of spatial information that these analyses produce, uh, maps with names like nodes, circulation, desire lines, are strung together as a layer of information that is draped over the site itself, used by architects to conceptualise and plan, but also to legitimise and validate their design strategies. As, as Paul Carter would declare, any design the land might have on us any indication that the land writes back through arabesques of self-organisation finds no place in the orthography of planning. As I've tried to stress throughout this presentation, the dissertation makes no claims that mitigate the selectivity of its research. It always effaces objectivity and instead presents a middle made ground, aiming to stand between verifiable facts and their interpretation. 
This is done in order to first. This is done in order to first reveal what is otherwise dismissed as anecdotal or superfluous information about a place, and thereafter to explore the meaningful and poetic, yet often tacit impressions everyday places such as Sydney Park can be found to harbour. This is never intended as an exercise in anachronism, but instead, um, <coughs> excuse me, but instead always as a practice oriented towards teasing out meaning and questioning our decisions and beliefs as we continue to move forward. In Dark Writing, Carter similarly suggests, we proceed with that memory, as if the spaces we inhabit are a tabula rasa that we can choose to inscribe as we wish. The human, environmental, and spiritual costs of this collective forgetfulness are everywhere to be seen. It is an urgent ethical responsibility to learn that we walk in the tracks of others, and having learned this, to regroove these traces creatively and differently. Without this power of creative recollection, we are doomed to repeat the same steps with the same destructive consequences. At the very end of the introduction to Made Ground, I pose the question of how we might understand the places into which we build the architectures of our future. Made Ground's contribution towards answering this question takes up these same incitations, made by Carter in Dark Writing, of learning to negotiate the meanings of marks made by the lives of the past. In its essays, Sydney Park is shown to exist at varying scales simultaneously. In the image and images and imaginations of an emerging nation, the maps drafted by its administrators, the narratives upheld by its indigenous custodians, the multiple disturbances of its geological profiles, and the lives lived either in, either in enjoyment of or exile from its landscape. Collectively, these essays can be understood to make the argument that the landscapes we inhabit are not historical artifacts, but open-ended processes in which we actively participate. Even if empty or in a so-called state of nature, um, the, the architect's peremptory image of the figure ground is never a, a lonely interval between objects. It is always an informative, generative matrix made by the intentions, actions, musings, and dreamings of people. To treat the architectural site as an interpretive network of narratives that, whether fragmented or reified, provides a texture in which to build, means design is able to contextualise itself imaginatively, openly, and meaningfully. It is therefore not possible to answer the question that asks how we might understand the places into which we build our futures, at least not without realising that in order for them to be understood, we have to rewrite them to begin with. Thanks. to hear that there were many aspects of it which uh, resonated with the way that we think about work. I think you were at our talk last night and uh, the subject of maps and the meaning of maps came up. Um, it's kind of hard to ask you any questions because I found that you covered so much ground and uh, I'm certainly going to go off and read Paul Carter's writings now, which I've you know before. Um, what I, one thing I really enjoyed was the way in which uh, you Used the, in your conclusion, you used the, the, the sort of material and the research of your dissertation as a way of speculating how it might um, help or guide you in relation to design work or to your work as an architect. Mm -hmm. And I suppose in that sense, I think it felt like um, a very full and meaningful piece of work that through looking at a very one place in one context, uh, you tried to generalise about what architects do or how we think about um, land and the meaning of land and the idea that uh, that nothing that it isn't um, nothing is finite or fixed as a historical artifact but that it's open and old <coughs> and also that a map is never objective, that, that there's that somebody's always trying to make a point to do something. Um, I do you have a question? Um, and then we'll, we'll Alexander, can I turn to you because 
obviously, <coughs> as chair, uh, you will have read it. You're yep. far, far more, uh, um, far more familiar with the work than, than the That's panel. Right. Can, maybe you could just summarise what it was about this dissertation, you know, that made it the, the winning. Well, it, I mean, I think there are there are several levels to it, and I would absolutely agree with uh, Shula's reading. I think it's very obvious that it has a, a really profound resonance with a lot of good architecture that's happening at the moment without necessarily, without at all being prescriptive, actually, and opening up a very different, sort of more careful and sustained way of thinking about the place. Um, but on a more prosaic, I suppose, level, it was an extraordinary accomplishment. I've been reading dissertations at this level for five years now as a member of the panel and then as chair. And I have to say the scope of it, its size, and the depth of the analysis, as well as the quality of the writing, were quite extraordinary. I, I really, none of us expected this kind of thing at the level of, let's say, part two or equivalent qualification. So, um, that was that. But I do have a little question for Jessica, and I wonder if this is not too um, sort of difficult to answer very quickly, because in some ways it lies at the heart of what you do. Clearly this isn't about some kind of comprehensive encyclopedia or analysis, I, I understand that very well. But I, I have been intrigued by your choice of the themes for the essays, the, the little sort of mini case studies within the case study. And although, if someone put the question to me, I could speculate why you might have chosen them. They have very clear complementarities and juxtapositions. But I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that and how interchangeable with others along those lines might they be, and what might that mean about the nature of this kind of analysis? Sure. Um, it's an interesting question. I think actually something that I never mentioned in the dissertation. Uh, I've never mentioned it up. And my supervisor, uh, with whom I decided that we should, I should do this, is I never actually went to the park. I never went there. I never walked through it. I never stood on its hills. I never walked through its forests. I only ever approached the park through the documents that existed of it. It's just an experiment. You know, how far can you get through the material that documents a place? It turns out you can get pretty far. And um, <laughs> that is sort of what ordered the, the, the essays. The, uh, maps were very important, um, journals were extremely important, journals were always kept by people obviously, so personalities were very important, um, paintings were very important, representations of any sort were, but also very technological um, reports, uh, technological, technical reports um, that were talking about you know, the disturbances of different compositions of soil and things like that. And, to sort of inhabit those documents for eight months or however long it took to write um, meant that it became very schematic for me how I needed to order my thinking anyway. And the essay sort of jumps straight out from In terms of how that transfers into other processes, I mean, I wouldn't advocate that architects don't ever visit their site, but I think that you know, there is this wealth of information that exists prior to your own experience and that raises ethical questions about who you are and how to interact with the landscapes in which you're intervening. Um, that answers one of my questions, because I, I had this beautiful feeling during your talk that I didn't really know anything about the park that you were describing. In fact, even as you described it, we didn't learn any more about it, except that it kept changing into whatever you chose to call it, a brickwork. So. Mm -hmm. And then what I was really, the landscape I felt I really was in was a kind of theoretical landscape that you were setting out, and the landscape beautifully described. Um, I just wrote down some things that you said, like uh, the land speaks back in arabesques. Mm. Um, and then having you reveal, I mean, it was very honest of you to reveal you hadn't been to the site ever. <laughs> but my question was, because you said that we, Understand the path. We understand the past from the spectator's point of view from the present. Mm. And I've never been to Australia. I don't even know if this place really exists. <laughs> um, we happen to be going to Australia next week, so we can check it out. <laughs> <laughs> but um, this man Carter, we walk in the tracks of others. Did you also make him up? <laughs> Maybe because, because if you if you did or if you didn't, it doesn't really matter because you 
he's the same as the park in the sense that he's the, he's the ground on which you stand and we don't need to. You, I was wondering, was there a second confession? <laughs> there is no Paul Carter. Yeah, I, wish there, I wish there were a second confession. I think what he allowed me though was a sort of legitimization of the way I wanted to write about yeah. about landscape and place and yeah. Australia and architecture anyway. You know, he's footnoted, he's referenced, he exists in libraries, I don't. And to throw him throughout my dissertation meant that it was given an authority or whatever that then meant I could just go and do my thing. And I think in that sense, maybe he doesn't really exist. He's just sort of my get out of jail free card. Uh, I think since the whole thing, all of us, ever, is a fiction anyway, if you know mm -hmm. what I mean, like the whole of our life is something we're telling ourselves. He would have been better placed maybe about a hundred years ago. The fact that he may still be living is a threat to your decision. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's dark writing. <laughs> David, have you got any further to add? I've got that to add. It, I, think it's, I think it's a really interesting starting point that you invert this huge critique of the city by concentrating on the holes in it, which I mean, essentially parts are to some degree, and you, know, you characterise it, I think, later as a landscape of waste, which I thought was a great phrase. Um, the, the struggle that students generally have with extended writing is actually imposing a structure on it which is um, coherent and which can give them enough um, energy to get to the end. So I think you saw the dissertation essentially as a piece of spatial design. Uh, but over and above any of that, actually, it's an attempt to give meaning. And with so much so-called architecture simply thrown up without meaning, uh, it's incredibly encouraging that um, uh, graduates coming out of schools uh, are ex extraordinarily preoccupied with meaning. So I, I completely congratulate you on that. I think it's a beautifully put together piece of work. Um, and you, you bring out all these things about the essential artifice of, of, of so-called natural landscapes, whether they're actually um, you know, the rural agrarian landscape or the, the urban civic space. You know, it's, a, it's a great point. I, I guess my question is, uh, if, if, if there was a sequel to this, um, and, and, and you know, maybe, maybe you have to rewrite the whole thing once you visited the park, um, <laughs> if it exists, as John rightly uh, points out, um, can this multivalent approach be applied to interrogating um, built environment rather than, if you like, unbuilt and managed land environments? I, I think definitely, uh, my hope would be that it, that it can. Uh, I think that maybe, it's not, something, it's not that something's lost, but there's an additional sort of pretext to the dissertation, which is being an Australian your relationship to land is always problematic. You, the land is at least always expropriated in some way. And to, to, in the dissertation, to sort of set out the way in which that occurred through very discrete events, through the sort of indoctrinated power of, of documentation of various types and so forth, was, I think, um, fascinating for me to see how, how it operates, how, how land is taken away from Aboriginal Australians in a very sort of calm and clinical fashion. And I think that realisation is applicable to, to sort of any project in Australia, at least in the sense, not ever in a sort of prescriptive way of generating architectural form, but as a, a kind of sensibility towards the ethical responsibility you have as someone who's intervening in that history or that landscape. You know, continuing the framing of you know, choosing to speak about it in a certain way, and in so doing, you're stabilizing the ground as something meaningful in the present and into the future. And I think that is that's an ethic that I think you know could be applied by any architect to any project, probably outside the context of Australia as well. But um, that's sort of I think what I'm going to carry forward into a hypothetical sequel or design. Work or whatever. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jasper. I think um, we must move on now. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.